I'll never forget this. The first day when we left that meeting, he said, you better keep up. You better keep up. My name is Tim Grover. I worked with Michael Jordan for 15 years. Everyone knows me as his trainer, but my official title was a sports enhancement specialist. If you walk into a gym and I've worked with you for two weeks, you're not my client. If I passed you a ball for one day and I shot video of you, you're not my client. I define a client of mine who's worked with me for numerous years. Scotty Pippen, numerous years. Charles Barkley, numerous years. Akeem Olajuwon, numerous years. Michael Jordan, numerous years. Kobe Bryant, numerous years. Dwayne Wade, numerous years. I mean, those are the top, top individuals. I have others that have had successful careers. I played college basketball at University of Illinois at Chicago. I've always been a basketball buff. So I, was, I actually did my thesis on strength and conditioning for basketball players. When I graduated college, I had a master's degree in exercise science and I always knew I wanted to train professional athletes. The only way you could really train professional athletes was working for a professional organization. I wanted to work more with individuals. So I actually wrote letters to all the players on the Chicago Bulls organization. And back then, there was no email. I wrote 14 letters to 14 different players. There are 15 players on a basketball team. The one person I did not write the letter to was Michael Jordan. I didn't get any response back, but I did get a call from the athletic trainer, Mark File at the time, saying, hey, we have a client that may be interested in your services. We want you to meet this individual, be at the house at one o'clock. So I go over there, I knock on the door, and guess who opens the door? I got a chance to sit with him for 30 minutes, told him what, what my philosophies were, what I could do for him. And he was looking for somebody that wanted to work directly with him. When you work with a team, you have a certain schedule. You're set on whatever the team schedule is. He wanted somebody that was a little bit more flexible and then somebody that would focus in on his body because everybody's needs are a little different. That was my path to him. I said, you know, give me 30 days. And let's see what happens and 30 days turned into 15 years. He had gave me a list of what he was doing before. I said, tell me what you'd like to incorporate, what would you like to keep out of this program? He goes, well, I want to start fresh. I want to start totally fresh. So my first thing with him was, all right, I don't care how fast you are, how high you jump. I said, none of that matters if you're constantly getting injured, if you're starting to have little nagging injuries. And one thing that he was very susceptible to was groin pulls and ankle injuries. So I said, let's address those things first. The more healthy you are, the better you'll be able to play. And I said, let's worry about being quicker, stronger, faster later. And most people put the concept of, we need to make you quicker, stronger, faster first. The quicker, stronger, faster you make an individual, the more susceptible they are to injuries. Because they don't know how to handle that extra speed. They don't know how to handle that extra quickness. They don't know how to handle that extra power. When you do those things, you gotta learn how to stop too. So everyone teaches you how to go, go, go. No one teaches you how to stop. So my big philosophy was him, all right, let's deal with the injuries that you have. Let's take care of those things first. And by doing that, the more healthier you get, it's automatically gonna improve your game. His obsession to win and to compete on the basketball court and everything he does was the same way that I felt. My obsession to help an athlete get better, to keep them injury free, to play every single game. And if something didn't work, it was like, I always felt it was like my fault. You know, if he missed a game winning shot, even though I wasn't out on the basketball court, well, what could I have done better? If he was more fresh, if he was in better condition, or if he turned an ankle, or if he jammed a finger, I'd automatically start thinking in my head, did I do too much? Didn't I do enough? Why did I leave that exercise out? I should have done this. So it's the constant rewind of everything over and over again to do it next time even better. Everyone knows Michael is a huge foundation and fundamentals guy. All the crazy stuff that you see him doing in the air and all the fancy moves, he never practiced those. He practiced the fundamentals because he knew if he could master the fundamentals, master the foundation, those other moves would automatically come. That was the same philosophy I had. We started off with just the basic compound movements that you would see any strength and conditioning individual do. You know, anything from 
bench press and dumbbell presses to cleans to deadlifts to squats all the basic stuff to build the foundation first during the off season we would go anywhere from an hour and a half to two hours as we got closer to the season the intensity increased and the time became a little short it would be about an hour to 90 minutes and then once the season started the workouts were anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes if there were certain things he just didn't want to do he would always say no gimmicks i want proven stuff i want proven fact i want proven results because that's what he was all about he was about proving himself every single game every single practice that he was the best athlete the best basketball player every single day a lot of trainers come in and they ask the client, how do you feel? It's your job to know how the client feels. You should have paid attention to how many minutes he played, how physical the game was, whether they won or lost, what kind of mental state this person is after a win, what kind of mental state is he in after a loss. And back then, remember, a lot of the games weren't even televised live, so you'd have to stay up late. I had to record the games on and then get up early the next morning and watch them before I could see my client. I was as obsessed as he was, but I, I needed to know. Now everyone, you have the Fitbits that, you know, count the person step. I would literally write down how many steps he took every single basketball game. I have pieces of paper still now. I would rewind it, watch it again, rewind it, watch again, one, two, three, four. This is how many steps he took in the first quarter. This is how many he took in the second. These how many took he took to the left. This is how many he took to the right, forward, back, all this stuff. So that way I could understand which body part and which angle he used most, which one he used less. And the training programs were totally developed around that methodology. If you look in a game, and you notice that they have a tendency to pull 50% more to the right and only 20% to the left. Well, if you're going equal distance when they're training, it's not gonna to correlate to the court. He would go so much more in one direction, you didn't wanna overuse that side, so you'd put the emphasis there. But that was the adjustments that somebody who's obsessive, you notice and you pay attention to. You're not gonna take a superstar who's that good and increase their abilities by 10% during an off season. It's just not gonna happen. They're looking for that one, 1% of how can I get better. Every single year, it has to show improvement. If it doesn't show improvement, then I'm not keeping up with them. So I would tell Michael, I'm gonna create more power, more strength, and more force for you. Now it's your job to learn how to control it and what you do with it. That's not my expertise. Whether I worked with Michael or not, he was still going to be the greatest basketball player ever. I helped him stay there a little bit longer. When we first started training him, we always did it after practice. With the amount of minutes he was playing, the physicality and so forth, I was like, Michael, we have to make this adjustment. I said, there's just not enough time. Let's move it before practice. Let's make it the first thing you do do in the morning. After each workout, after each game, after each practice, I would ask him one question. I would say five, six, or seven. And he would either give me a number or he would put up a hand. So if he did this, that means be at the house at 5 a.m. If he did six, it was be at the house at six, it was time to be at seven. And that's how the breakfast club evolved. He invited Scottie Pippen and then Ron Harper. They would work out every single morning. Big elaborate setup in the in the basement downstairs. Each one had a little different program because they all had needs that were particular to those individuals. And afterwards, if you showed up for the workout, you got a chance to eat breakfast upstairs. Those guys never missed a workout. They never missed a workout. Because if you missed a workout, the tongue lashing and the trash talking, Michael would talk to you at practice that next morning you're better off making it to the workout and not having to hear his mouth than to show up at practice knowing you missed the workout. I don't consider it tough. I consider it accountability. He was like, if I train this hard, I play this hard, I practice this hard, if I can go 38 minutes in a game and come to practice the next day, be taped up, ready to go, and practice as hard as I possibly can, why can't you? 
People know the game was so much more physical back then. Nowadays, you can go around the players. Back in those days, you had to go through them, around them, over them, under them. You had to develop all those things. So the Detroit Pistons were his main nemesis, but it was also like he wanted to be known as the most dominant player ever. Michael was up for anybody. He didn't care. Every game, every practice, every off day was circled on Michael's calendar. He would go into practice wanting to destroy anybody and everybody in practice. And he said, the harder I practice, the easier the game will become. He did everything to an extreme, so it would actually make the games much easier for him. It worked. Every single practice, every single training session, every single game, Michael always gave you a wow moment. When they won their first championship and they were playing the Los Angeles Lakers, they lost the first game. And I remember him telling me, he goes, we're winning this series. I saw everything I needed to see. Every loss was a learning experience. It was an education thing. He didn't beat himself up over it. Michael C's got this great statement. He goes, I never lost a game. I just ran out of time. He played between 213 and 218. That was his weight. And depending on whether they were gonna handle him more physically, whether he needed to be a little bit more finesse, being able to jump a little higher, jump a little faster. So the adjustments were constantly made, but it was more to keep his body at a chronological age that wasn't the same as his physiological age. Now that he was getting up there, you know, 29, 30, 31, I still wanted his body to be able to perform as though it was two years younger. As an athlete gets older, there's certain types of muscle fibers that have a tendency not to work the same way. And you have to continue to work those at a rapid pace. So I don't need you to be stronger anymore because there is a point of no return with an athlete where they can actually become too strong or they can become too big and it actually has an adverse effect on how they train. So what happened was as we got older, his weights actually got lighter, but the movements got faster. The idea was, okay, I need you to move this amount of weight from point A to point B faster than you did last year. The workouts became shorter in duration, but increased in intensity. As his star grew, there was less time for me because there's more time needed for endorsements, different travel, family. So I'm not gonna say, hey listen, I still need three hours a day, I still need two hours a day. What are the variables, what are the things that I need to keep in? How can I still get the same results in a two hour workout in 45 minutes now? Well, as the body slows down, how about if we have the brain to see things faster? to be able to recognize things ahead of time. I can't have you lifting the weight at the same speed, but you have the ability to process information faster because you have more knowledge, you have more understanding. So that's why we started to do different things with lights and objects and so forth. Like when he would be tired, I, I would give him something to think about, some kind of puzzle to figure out, some kind of light thing to figure out. So that, hey, while the brain is tired, let's challenge it because if resistance makes your muscles grow, well, resistance makes the brain sharper. I didn't travel with him, because I never worked for the organization. So I was not allowed on the team plane. I'd have to book my own flights, have everything set up before he got there, scope the different local gyms and see what's going on. Phil Jackson had told Michael that he couldn't travel with his golf clubs anymore. So it became my responsibility to take his golf clubs, even if he wasn't gonna play. To me, that was part of his training regimen. I knew how relaxed it made him from a mental standpoint. It helped him get into the zone. If you watch the old videos of the Beatles, how people used to surround them, imagine that that's how it was with him wherever he went. Individuals would literally hand their children and just say, just touch my baby. Because they thought he had this like magical power that were like, it, it, was, it was the craziest thing. 
And as, once he was in the hotel, he couldn't leave. So golf was the one place where he could go somewhere. The taking of the clubs was as important from a mental standpoint for him. His mind could literally be off of basketball and the obsession of everybody else around him. And just by observing things and by tracking to see if he played golf, what was his mental state afterwards? What were the results in the game? If he ate this, did he score more points? Did he score less? If he took a nap at four and he, and he got up at 5.30, if he took a nap at two and got up at three, what were the outcomes of the game? Every little bit, if he drank a certain glass of wine, whatever, I paid attention to everything and how it related to the end result. The training for baseball is completely different than the training for basketball. The easiest way to give an example is when you play basketball, there's a certain amount of arc that goes on a basketball shot to maximize the space on the rim. When you throw a baseball from right field, you can't put an arc on the ball. It's got to be from point A to point B as fast as you can. So you have to retrain the whole shoulder muscle what movement it's going to do. So the exercises we did for basketball were not applicable for baseball. The way you swing when you lead with your hips, completely different in baseball when you're swinging a bat than when you're stepping into a basketball shot. The funniest thing was when he got there in the minor leagues, those guys were a lot younger than him. In all the conditioning drills, he was lapping everybody there. He was like the first one done. And Michael always did more. So if you told him, you know, back and forth 10 times, He's going to do 12. He's going to do 13. That's just his competitive nature. He said, I'm not going to let anybody outdo me. During my off time between his retirement and when we started the baseball training, I had already started to put a workout together and started to do my research and homework saying, if he ever comes back, what's going to happen from a physiological standpoint what would we have to do in order to get him back? When he came back and he started to play, we had a discussion with him. And I said, Michael, there's not enough time to transition your body. Because he came back at the end of that season. And I said, there's not enough time to transition your body from baseball to basketball. For you to be playing at the optimal level that you were before, I said, there just isn't enough time. Now, from a skill standpoint, that's on you. Okay, but I'm just telling you from a performance standpoint, there just, there just isn't. When that happened, I don't remember the day that they lost that game to Orlando. I think it was a home game. We were the last ones in the arena. We're getting ready to leave out. And I said, Michael, I'll see you. He goes, I'll see you tomorrow. So that training process started right away. A lot of athletes mature physically, but they don't mature mentally. Michael's game not only became sharper physically, but it also became more defined and more sharper from a mental standpoint. He knew when to use energy, when to conserve it. He knew how to intimidate the opponent without having to say a word. We talk about this in our book, Relentless. He was known as one of the biggest trash talkers out there. But he didn't trash talk to get into the opponent's head. He would trash talk to get into his own head because now whatever he said, he had to go out and back it up. So if he went and told you, I'm going to give you 50, that wasn't to put pressure on the opponent. That was to put pressure on himself to say, now I've said this, I have to deliver. Because his expectations were always greater than what anybody else put on him. I actually moved to Washington with him. It was a two year period. And they didn't get into the playoffs, they didn't win as much. But the biggest accomplishments, and if I remember right, his last year at the age of 40, he played 82 games. Listen, you want your team to win. You want him to have the trophy because that's the ultimate prize but you have to set individual goals for yourself. As the trainer of the greatest athlete, 
You can't set a realistic goal. You can't set, I'd be happy if he plays 70 games. You have to set an unrealistic goal of saying, I want him healthy enough, physically and mentally, to play every single game. A cooler is an individual who's good at what they do. You give them a job to do, they get that job done. Nothing exceptional. There used to be this term on sports, and they still use it now, that you know that person's a closer, where the closer is they would hit the game-winning shot, or uh, the pitcher that comes in the game, or somebody hits the, uh, the home run. Closer's an individual that's great at what they do. They produce that end result as long as many variables aren't thrown at them. When I was watching Michael and they would call him a closer, and I would just say, you cannot classify him just like everybody else. I have this concept, it's called a cleaner. A cleaner is an individual that delivers that end result over and over again, no matter what's thrown at them. They deliver multiple championships, multiple aha moments, multiple end results. And that's what Michael did. And because he never really stopped, because here's the one thing, his obsession with the game was whenever you said he couldn't do something, it became a challenge to him. You know, it was like, all right, Michael, you can't win a championship leading the league in scoring. Yes, you can. So I'm gonna go lead the league in scoring and win a championship. Michael, you can't lead the league in scoring and be the best defensive player in the league. Yes, I can. I can lead the league in scoring, win a championship, and be the most dominant player on both ends of the court. So whatever somebody challenged him about, it was like, I can show you. The way I described him is you weren't going to a basketball game. You were going to a performance. It was like going to a ballerina. It was like going to the opera. If you ever went to the United Center when Michael was playing, people would literally be dressed up in suits. Suits, ties. The women would be in evening gowns. And when the buzzer went off in the introduction, everybody was in their seats. You did not want to miss a moment because you never knew what he was going to do. And every single game, every single moment, he never disappointed you. He's the one that set the trend of basketball players lifting, basketball players training, individuals having their own individual. Your superstars, they're not afraid to share their knowledge, their expertise, what they did. That's how I got to Kobe was through Michael. He was the one that recommended me. He's the one that says, hey, this is the, why don't you try, why don't you try my guy? They're not afraid to do that because you know what? It forces them to elevate their game because they know there are no secrets out there. There are no secrets. You look at the top, top athletes, they'll lay everything out on the table. Receiving the information is free. There's no cost to that. The price comes in is what you do with that information. And most people just aren't willing to pay the price or well, they're not willing to pay the price long enough. Michael paid the price all the time, every single practice, every single off day, every single game.